So this is my presentation for Growth in Christian Life on um, Cyril of Jerusalem and the importance of personal decision and intention in baptism. So a quick background on Cyril of Jerusalem. Um, little is known about his life, but he was um, estimated to be born in 315 AD. Um, he was given the position of Bishop of Jerusalem in 350 AD. He was uh, exiled three times, which just shows the political tensions of the time. And he delivered the Catechumenical Lectures, which are his most famous work, which is later written down. And the Procatechesis is the introduction to these lectures, which we'll be looking at today. So, just beginning with the time that Cyril was living in the 4th century AD. Um, in order to compare baptism back then to baptism today, it is important to remember what the sacrament of baptism was like back in the 4th century. So, the 4th century baptism began outside of the church with the renunciation of Satan. There was the stripping of the garments, which represented the return to Eden. Um, there was the process of leading to the baptismal pool where the catechumens would be immersed. Uh, in the pool, and there was a declaration of belief in the Trinity. So, it brings me to my thesis. So, in accordance with Cyril's ideas, it is true that a life-changing and meaningful baptism must be a result of personal decision, and thus, those who do not have the ability to make a conscious choice should not be baptized. So, the question remains, what makes a meaningful baptism. And we can use Cyril's work to demonstrate what is necessary for a meaningful and transformative baptism. So, here we have the baptismal font, which is where the catechumens would be immersed in water, which symbolizes um, their rebirth in Christ. The catechumens must build their own personal and internal baptismal fonts through the preparation for baptism. So the components that make up the baptism each symbolize a wall of the baptismal font. And the first is intention. In Cyril's work, he states, if you are here in, if here in body but not in mind, you gain nothing. He means that baptism is not life-saving without good intention. Simply going through the physical ceremony of a baptism is not enough to be saved. And he gives the example of Simon Magnus, who went through the ceremony but did not really mean it. And he gives this as an example to the catechumens of what not to do. So, he, um, he emphasizes that intent is critical because you can come to be baptized for other reasons, um, for personal gain um, or bad intentions, but only good intentions will be recognized by God. So don't be sending this. The second component of a meaningful baptism is education and mental preparation. So there's many reasons why education and mental preparation are necessary for a meaningful baptism. Through education, one is shaped and made knowledgeable about the Christian religion. And one of my favorite metaphors is he compares it to being an unworked lump of gold. And through the educational process, you're purified and your value increases until you are in a better state. Um, another reason is that baptism is the first step in Christian life. And from there, you will grow. So um, being educationally prepared in your time before baptism, you're laying a foundation for your Christian life. And he uses the example of a tree, and the educational process is what lays the roots. And then when you grow, you, the tree can grow upward, but it's rooted in Christian teachings and Christian values. And he uses the same idea, he compares it to a house, and a house can be built upward brick by brick, but if the foundation has any gaps, the whole house will collapse. So this preparation helps to educate the catechumens on Christian teachings and Christian values. And this is most important because it makes them, allows them, I should say, to make an educated choice. Um, they can choose the Christian religion because they know what the Christian religion stands for and they know that their own ideas coincide with those values. And lastly, education is used as a defense of Christianity. This is especially important at the time because Christianity needed defending. So being a new Christian initiated into this new group of people, you will be deterred by other people and you need education and a firm understanding of what Christianity stands for to defend the religion but also to defend yourself and not to be deterred by these people. So, the last component is a desire for life change. So baptism is supposed to be a rebirth in Christ, and as Seal emphasizes over and over again, it is transformative, it is life-changing. So once you're baptized, you're supposed to avoid sin, 
and you're supposed to live a Christian lifestyle as much as possible. Um, he uses um, the metaphor of a garment, a dirty garment that should be taken off and a new garment should be put on to represent living a pure life. The sacrament of baptism can only be this life-changing experience if the catechumen has a desire in their heart to be changed. The process of changing one's life is difficult and it requires a lot of personal sacrifice and this can only really happen if there is a desire in one's heart to be changed. So it is not only about the desire in one's heart, but being capable of changing one's life and repenting. So now we revisit the baptismal font and we have built the necessary components for um, baptism, which are good intention, educational preparation, and a desire for life change. And now the baptismal font is ready for the sacrament. So now that we've looked at fourth century baptism, we can show how Cyril's ideas are timeless when we compare them to baptism in the 21st century. So, what does baptism look like today? There are two types of baptism which we're familiar with. There's infant baptism and there's adult or believer's baptism. Infant baptism we're most familiar with because it's what's used by the Catholic Church. Um, the infant is essentially baptized within a few months of their birth. They're given godparents, which are signed by the parents because they can't make their own religious decisions yet. Um, and there's really no proclamation of faith or anything like that because um, the parents choose the religion or the Christian denomination for the child. And then adult baptism, which is used by uh, a lot of Baptist churches in the United States and all over the world, there's no really specific age you're baptized when you feel ready to be baptized. Um, and it's a community event. It's uh, participated from the whole parish. Um, and most importantly, the uh, baptismal candidate makes a proclamation of faith, so they state that they have been through the, the process to be, um, become baptized and that they proclaim that they believe in the Trinity. So does infant baptism or believer's baptism coincide more with serial sacrament of baptism? So we go back to the three components of baptism. Can infants have good or bad intention? Can they be educated? And can they choose to change their lives? And I think the answer is rather obvious. No, it's not really possible for them. They're not capable. So which of the two provides a more meaningful baptism? And in my opinion, well, adult or believer's baptism provides a more meaningful baptism because Infants do not choose their religion, it's being chosen for them. Um, infants cannot be educated and therefore they don't understand what Christian teachings and values are and they're not making an educated choice about their religion. They can't readily defend the Christian religion because they are get put into this group of people and they can't really explain why the, they have chosen it. Um, and their minds are too young and capable of forming intention, so they're really only there in body, they're not there in mind, um, which Cyril emphasizes is a critical part of baptism. Um, and baptism alone does not ensure salvation, so just by being there, present does not mean that you will be saved. Um, and there must be a desire in one's heart for life change, but because infants don't consciously sin at such a young age, they can't repent and they can't be reborn into a new life, which is one of the main components of the sacrament. So just going back to my thesis, um, it's clear that those who are not capable of making conscious choice uh, and who are not capable of intention, life change, or education do not experience a meaningful baptism and are not transformed in the sacrament. So I want to leave you with one of my favorite quotes in the Procatechesis about what baptism really means for all of the catechumens and how it means something different for everyone. And the point is, if all of these transformative and life-changing things are possible, um, are they possible if a person doesn't actually choose to be baptized? And if the sacrament of baptism doesn't mean all these things, should it not be the privilege of those who truly want it? So that's the thought to leave.